uh, I'm Sun Ning from the uh, School of Philosophy at Fudan University. And uh, it's really been an honor to, uh, to present you the fourth Dewey Lecture organized by uh, our Dewey Center at Fudan University. So the Dewey Lecture, as you might know, uh, is an annual lecture series co-founded by the director of Dewey Center, Professor uh, Chen Yajun, and the visiting professor of Dewey Center, Professor Rex Lee in, I think, 218. Our original plan was for each year, we invite a world-renowned philosopher who has made the distinguished contribution to the pragmatic tradition to give a lecture or a lecture series on any topics by his or her own choice. So the uh, previous three lectures are uh, Roger Ames, Robert Brandon, and Richard Bernstein, uh, who had, I'm sorry to say that, passed away this spring. Uh, I also want to uh, mention that the lecture notes of all three lectures uh, have been uh, translated and uh, published into Chinese. This year, we have the very great honor to have Professor Hugh Price with us to give the fourth Dewey Lecture. Later, I think our host, Professor Lee, will give a short introduction of Professor Price's work. Also, we are extremely grateful to have Professor Helen Beebe and Carlo Ravelli on board this year as our who did quite influential works. Now I think I'll pass time to our host, Professor Rex Lee. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Sun. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends and colleagues from all over the world, uh, may I welcome you to the Fudan Dewey Lecture organized by Dewey Center and School of Philosophy at Fudan University. Uh, I'm Rex Lee, the host of today's lecture. And uh, I'm going to introduce the speaker of today, uh, Professor Hugh Price, his life and works. And his topic today is time for pragmatism, talking about time. Let's go through the rundown for today. Uh, as you will see, I'll give a very short introduction uh, of Professor Price, uh, followed by his speech, uh, which is about 45 minutes. Afterwards, I will introduce uh, in a few words about Professor Bibi, uh, and then Professor Bibi will give a commentary of about uh, uh, 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, next is uh, Professor uh, Rovilla. Uh, Rovilla would be, uh, 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 I will introduce, and then he will be uh, presenting. Initially, we thought in a video, but uh, we are pleasantly surprised that he will be, uh, he, he, he is here and he would be able to speak to us. That would be wonderful. And afterwards, uh, by about, uh, afterwards, uh, we will have an open floor uh, discussion, uh, inviting the floor to ask questions. Finally, it would be a closing remarks by Professor Chen. Well, uh, let me start here with a little bit with philosophy. Uh, and everybody knows uh, uh, Eminent Kant is a great philosophy of, of great philosopher of all times. Uh, let me start with him. And, and he is the professor of logic and metaphysics at the University of Connorsford in the 18th century. Among many of his original ideas, he proposed that uh, there are categories of thought. Uh, they operate within space and time. Time is not things in themselves, but the shape we feel about things. And uh, Kant is a very disciplined person and is very precise about time. So precise that his neighbors set the clocks by his daily walks, it was reported. Interesting enough, time made errors because in the 18th century he has only access to mechanical clock and the measuring errors one to two seconds per day by the 20th century we have the quartz clock 
and the measuring error is reduced still one to two seconds per five years. Now in the 21st century, we have the CCN clock and the error is further, further reduced to one second to 30 million years. Oh, marvelous. So, thing, so that's things in themselves have errors, not count, and the error is a measurement. Now, let me talk, let me tell you a, a, a bit about uh, the speaker today, Professor Hugh Price. He is a contemporary philosopher and he studies time all his life. He challenges the time error and he tries to think of time going backward and he tries to think uh, out of the box thinking beyond time. So what does he mean? Well, he is uh, I, I'll tell you a little about his background. Uh, the Price family is some kind of Ox Oxbridge. Uh, Oxbridge family, interesting enough, is a marriage of Oxford and Cambridge. And, and uh, Hugh's mother is from London School of Economics in Cambridge in 1939. And his father is uh, a PhD from Oxford in 1959. Uh, they marry and they had four children and uh, so it's a marriage of Cambridge and Oxford and Hugh studies in both Oxford and Cambridge. It's another brother uh, who earned another PhD in Cambridge, Elfrin, and they have four, uh, the Price family has four children, two PhDs. Uh, Hugh was born in the UK in 1953 although he would be considered an Australian philosopher. It is because the whole family moved to Sydney in 1966 when Hugh was about 13 years old. There he studied uh, in Australian National University and initially he was in, in, interested in, in astronomy. In 1974, he met Hugh Bella a Cambridge philosopher who ignited his interest in philosophy. He completed his master in Oxford and then PhD in Cambridge under Hugh Miller. His academic career started in Australia and stayed in Sydney University for over 20 years. In year 2011, he became the Bertrand Russell Professor of Philosophy in Cambridge University. For the next 10 years, there he founded the Center of the Study of Existential Risks in year 2012, and later he also founded the Leverhulm Center for the Study of Future Intelligence. Existential risks is the risk of AI overtaking human intelligence some super machine intelligence uh, that escaped the constraint of, of biology. This is another exciting and complex topic for another lecture, not for today. Well, Price's major work, uh, he published over 10 books and numerous general articles on philosophy and science. And among them, uh, he always tried to think out of the box and challenge the received wisdom. For example, Stephen Hawking wrote A Brief History of Time in 1988. He challenged the idea of time error and proposed a starting point from no when. Another example is Richard Rorty's classic Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature in 1979. He challenged the mirror metaphor and defense naturalism. His intellectual heritage is undeniably Cambridge with all the great historical names, Bertrand Russell, Ramsey, Wittgenstein, Phil, and more recently, Dummett, Blackburn, and Miller. He is also influenced by the, influenced by the American primates, Sellers, Rotti, Brandon. So he is the person bringing out uh, Cambridge primatism, I should say. 
let me go on to the issue of time that we are going to discuss today and see how time is being treated not only in philosophy but let's have a broader view how time is treated in literature and in science in the 16th century Shakespeare saw time as almighty in the next few centuries the poets wanted to befriend time, want to rethink time, accept time, seize time, whatever. They have a lot of ideas. Here are some famous lines. Devouring time. Time defeats everything. That's Shakespeare's thoughts because Shakespeare thinks that uh, time uh, plunges out lines pause. That is not even the strongest can uh, can stay beyond time time is almighty and then here we have another famous line future and time future contained in time past apparently t.s Eliot's sense is somewhat similar uh, similar to our speakers today for the Chinese, time is invaluable and priceless. They try to compare time with gold in a proverb. Time has value of gold, but gold cannot buy time. Another famous Chinese poet, Qi uh, Yuan, uh, a politician, a great thinker of ancient China, he wrote, but the infinite universe and the long diligence of human life are beyond our present reach and i don't hear the future as for time in science i should say that the scientists are less sentimental they study time by thought experiments and real observation renowned figures like uh, bosman albert einstein Warner, uh, Heinsberg, uh, Arthur Eddington, they all make great contribution in our study of, in our scientific study of time. The paradigm, simply put, is like this. The consensus of the community is a paradigm, so to speak. And first, time is fundamental. It's related to space and the speed of light. We are talking about time and in fact it is light. Second, time is measured by photon frequency uh, and we can measure it uh, very accurate, at least as accurately as we can now with the CCM clock. And time is measured and has the smallest unit, track time. Anything below that would not be considered time. There's no time below that unit. Another important thing is that time is relative to the observer. So time measurement de depends on the observer, and that's uh, Einstein's very famous spe uh, specific theory of relativity. And time as a fourth dimension merged together to become space-time. And time starts from Big Bang, therefore, there is no time before Big Bang. Time must be uh, going forward, and all scientists believe in time error. Now it's time for philosophy to meet science. Our speaker, Professor Hugh Price, has an unusual view on time. He wants to start then we have some fun dialogue with you on time and play and time and price. Uh, question. What is the price of time? Priceless. How can we get more time? No when. How can I know more about time? Well, listen to price. Now this lecture. Thank you very much. I would let's now uh, Give an applause and welcome Professor Pride. Thank you.
Thank you, Rex, for that uh, very kind and amusing introduction. Um, and thanks also to the Dewey Center for the kind invitation to deliver this lecture, which was originally supposed to happen, like many things, uh, two years ago. Um, it's a great honor to be here um, and to be the fourth lecturer in this distinguished series. Uh, and thanks also in particular to um, Helen and to Carlo for agreeing to be the commentators for this lecture. The talk I'm going to give you is based on a paper, a long paper, which is going to appear in an Oxford University Press volume called Neopragmatism, edited by Joshua Gert from the College of William and Mary. Um, let me start off by saying a little bit about what I mean by neopragmatism. And I'll do that first by mentioning some examples. I'll, I'll be talking about these examples later in the talk. So, for example, the views of um, David Hume or the Cambridge philosopher Frank Ramsey on causality. Uh, in both cases, Hume and Ramsey are telling us, they're not giving us a metaphysical account of what causality is. In both cases, we're offered what Ramsey calls a psychological analysis. So it's not metaphysics, it's a story about how causal thinking arises in creatures like us. Not, as I said, a story about what causation is. And this shift from metaphysical analysis on one hand to psychological or linguistic explanation on the other is the core of what I mean by neopragmatism and what neopragmatism means in the context of the volume in which um, my paper will appear. In a lot of my work, I also use the term expressivism and for the purposes of our talk here today, uh, we can think of those terms as meaning the same thing. So neopragmatism is always seeking to explain some aspect of how the world In terms of some feature of us, uh, Sellers contrasted the manifest image in terms of the scientific image. So in Ramsey's case, for example, he's explaining the causal character of the manifest image in terms of the, um, the epistemic viewpoint of a, a deliberate, deliberating agent, of an agent who's trying to decide what to do. Another I'm sorry, another useful metaphor and one that I'll allude to at a couple of points in the talk is, is Kant's Copernican metaphor. Rex, I'm glad you mentioned Kant at the beginning of your kind introduction uh, because one of the central ideas in Kant is very similar to neopragmatism. That is, it's a matter of explaining the apparent structure of the world as an artifact of our viewpoint in some way. And, and that's the idea for which Kant famously uses the Copernican metaphor. Now, if you're interested in neopragmatism, then an important question is, how far do you go? Is neopragmatism a local view applicable to some concepts, but not to others? For example, it might be applicable to causation, but, but not to other kinds of terms that occur in science or elsewhere. Or is it a global view? Is there a pragmatic ingredient in all our concepts, as William James famously thought? There's this line from William James that um, pragmatists love to quote, and I think it's a very good slogan for global pragmatism. James says, the trail of the human serpent is thus over everything. In other words, all our concepts have a kind of human ingredient. And the pragmatist is trying to um, call attention to and explain the role of that ingredient in the concepts concerned. But my overall argument in this talk is that thinking about the temporal aspects of language and thought, thinking about what kinds of creatures we are in time, supports James's global conclusion. The structure of the talk is like this. Um, it's in six steps. Uh, and the steps lead from a narrow focus at one end to a very general focus at the other end. So you can think of the steps as a, a stairway, and as we ascend the stairway, we're moving in the direction of greater generality. 
As you see at the top of the slide here, uh, I was originally hoping to do this in, in five steps. And the reason for that was that the first version of this talk uh, was originally intended for uh, a little conference bringing together people interested in Buddhism with people interested in uh, physics and philosophy of time. And partly online um, in April of this year. So I thought I, I already had uh, James's metaphor of the, the trail of the human serpent. I thought I had an audience which included some Buddhists. So I thought, I know, I know what we need. We need a, a five-headed serpent. That will be familiar to, to the, the Buddhist half of uh, the audience. Unfortunately, as the talk developed, I wanted to put in step six. So I had to get rid of uh, my uh, five-headed serpent. And, and so it's, it's now six steps to global pragmatism, not five. And then after I, uh, I finished the talk, I came across this wonderful image of a Buddha surrounded, as you can see, by six snake heads. And the reason he's got six is that uh, the snake at the top has um, been lost at some point. And in a sense, that's a, a very good metaphor for, for my kind of pragmatism. Because the snake at the top is the one who'd have a claim to a sort of God's eye point of view superior to all the rest. And one of the, the um, central ideas in pragmatism, is, um, particularly in pragmatists like uh, Rorty, is, is there's, there's no such viewpoint. There's no God's eye viewpoint. Uh, all we have is a multiple human viewpoint. So there are my six steps. And we'll start with temporal indexicals. What, what, what are temporal indexicals? Well, consider uh, in English terms like now and its various synonyms and terms such as yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and tensed expressions in general, that is expressions where the form of a verb or something else indicates the temporal location of something in relation to our own temporal location at the time of speaking. Other kinds of indexicals do a similar thing with respect to space, terms in English like here and there, or with respect to personal identity, terms like I and our and you. Here's a, a, a Chinese example of these terms in use. Uh, this is a, a picture I took um, thinking I might be able to use it in a talk at some point. I think it was in Beijing airport on my first visit to China in 2007. Perhaps somebody in the audience knows if it looks like uh, the signs that are in Beijing airport, or at least it used to be there in 2007. Uh, and I particularly like this sign because uh, in, in the English version of it, it, it has all three of the, the different kinds of indexicals, the personal one, you, the spatial one here, and the temporal one now. They're all explicit in the sign. Now, for the spatial and personal indexicals, here and I, almost everybody is a neopragmatist. That is, almost nobody thinks that in using these terms, that we need, we need to understand in metaphysical terms. But many philosophers and some physicists um, think that the temporal case is different. They think that there is an objective now, an objective present moment, in a sense in which there isn't an objective here. Whereas a pragmatist will say, treating now like here, that we can explain our use of tense language without requiring a distinctive subject matter. And the pragmatist will present that as an example. We don't have to worry about this uh, misconceived metaphysical project of understanding how time can have a distinguished present moment. The idea that there's such a thing is just a sort of trick of the language. Okay, that's our first step. Second step, what makes time special? And here I'm uh, taking the subheading from the title of this lovely book that came out a few years ago by Craig Callender, uh, a philosopher at the uh, University of California, San Diego. Here are four ways in which time seems to differ from space. The first is the one that we just mentioned, the apparent reality of the now. The second is the sense that time passes or flows in some way. The third is the difference between the, the fixed past and the open future. 
And the fourth is the sense that time has a preferred direction. Now, some of these things might be different ways of, um, uh, as it were, saying the same thing. And for example, the third and the fourth, people might run those together. No, I think it's worth distinguishing them all because you know, there are versions uh, of uh, views of time according to which these are all separate things. Now, my recommendation is for pragmatism on all these topics. Uh, I'm not going to give you the detailed arguments uh, for that um, in this talk. That would take too long. But I'm going to give you some examples of philosophers and physicists taking what I take to be the neo-pragmatist position. So in, in order to give you a sense of what the position amounts to uh, for most of these um, uh, for, for most of these features of, of, of time or, or manifest time has come to cause it, time as it seems to be to us. Let's start with some Cambridge philosophers. This is uh, the first quote here is from Bertrand Russell in 1913. It's a famous paper called On the Notion of Cause, in which Russell argues that really there's no such thing as causality. He argues that modern physics has no, no place for it. Uh, and at one point in the paper, he, he turns to the difference between the apparently fixed past and the open future. And he says, the memory works backward and not forward, we should regard the future as equally determined by the fact that it will happen. So Russell is suggesting here that our sense that the future is open and the past is fixed rests on a feature of us, namely the fact that our memory works in one direction, but not the other. Now, there's two questions. One is, is Russell right about that? But the more important thing from my point of view here is that uh, it's clearly, a, um, it, it's a neo-pragmatist suggestion in my terms. That is, it's a, it's a proposal for explaining an aspect of the way in which time seems to be in terms of a feature of us not in terms of some fundamental feature of reality. Okay, moving forward uh, 15 or 16 years, this is from uh, a late paper by Frank Ramsey. Frank Ramsey was uh, a very brilliant philosopher, well, not just a philosopher, he was also a mathematician and an economist and made groundbreaking contributions to all those fields before his tragically early death um, at the age of 26 in 1930. But when it is, Late papers written in uh, September 1929. He says, it is, it seems, a fundamental fact that the future is due to the present, but the past is not. What does this mean? It's not clear, and if we try to make it clear, it turns into nonsense or a definition. What then do we believe about the future that we do not believe about the past? This seems to me to be the root of the matter, Ramsey says. That I cannot affect the past is a way of saying something quite clearly true about my degrees of belief. Uh, and interestingly, I, I, I realized uh, quite recently that Ramsey here seems to be answering a question um, posed by Eddington, uh, who Rex mentioned in the introduction, uh, who'd written a, a, a very popular book called The, the Nature of the Physical World, um, published in 1928. Um, and we know that Ramsey read that book um, because his notes, uh, his notes based uh, based on his reading, survive in the Ramsey ar archives in Pittsburgh. Okay, but um, history aside, what matters is that again that this is clearly um, a neo-pragmatist view about the difference between the past and the future, the sense that the, the future is open and the past is fixed. Okay, now going back a few years uh, and turning to the topic of the direction of time, I'm just going to give you this little quote from Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, another person that um, uh, Rex mentioned in his introduction. At one point in 1895, Boltzmann says, for the universe, the two directions of time are indistinguishable. wholeheartedly endorsing this view at this point. He's just putting it on the table as a, in the context of a particular proposal. We don't need to go into the details here. Um, but 
again, the important thing here is that it counts as a, a neo-pragmatist proposal. Um, because Boltzmann is suggesting that there's no fundamental uh, direction of time, no fundamental difference between the past and the future. It's just that um, sort of features of our local environment, as it were, um, give us the impression that one direction is uh, different from the other, just as features of our gravitational environment on the surface of the Earth give us the distinction between up and down. But we now know, of course, that that distinction is not of any great significance from the universe's point of view, from the point of view of the universe. Now, in my view, and this is something that I, I've argued in various places, it's hard to make sense of what it would be for time to have an intrinsic direction, at least if we want to connect that fact to our ordinary dealings with time in physics and in ordinary life. But it's easy to explain why temporally oriented creatures like us, all sharing the same orientation, should think of this as an objective feature of our environment, just as our ancestors did, presumably, of the, the difference between up and down. And the recognition of this perspectival element has its usual Copernican advantages. It avoids a need for structure in the world by explaining the appearance of structure as an artifact of our viewpoint. Okay, we have to move on. Um, now to the third step, the temporal modalities, causation and probability. In both cases, I think, uh, with probability and with causation, there are two big things uh, that uh, an adequate philosophical account of these notions ought to explain. One is the connection that these notions have to rational decision. That's what I call the practical relevance constraint. And the second is their temporal orientation. So the sense we have that it's the past that determines the chances of the future and the fact that causes typically precede their effects. So we have these two sorts of things to explain. In the case of probability, the practical relevance issue is very well known and we can find lots of um, well-known philosophers of probability in the 20th century alluding to it in various ways. For example, uh, Ramsey again. Ramsey um, um, grew up in, in, in Cambridge and was an undergraduate at the time when um, John Maynard Keynes had just published a book on um, propositions. And Ramsey objected to that view uh, that such relations would, quote, would stand in such strange correspondence with degrees of belief. So what Ramsey seems to mean is that Ramsey's, is that Keynes's uh, account of probability couldn't account for the practical relevance of probability for its connection with degrees of belief and hence with betting. Um, in the late forties, uh, the British philosopher William Neal says, knowledge of probability relations is important chiefly for its bearing on action. Uh, and this view from Neil was picked up by uh, Hugh Mallow, my PhD supervisor, in his book on chance in 1971. Um, after quoting Neil, Mallow says, it must follow from our account of chance that the greater the known chance of an event, the more reasonable it is to act as if it will occur. So in, again, Mallow is emphasizing the need for an account of chance or probability to, to explain the practical relevance of the notion, its bearing on such things as choice of action and betting behavior. Uh, a few years later again, the great American metaphysician, uh, David Lewis, says, I wonder whether anyone but a subjectivist, which means in our terms, essentially a neo-pragmatist, is in a position to understand objective chance. So Lewis too thought that an account of objective chance needed to begin with its practical relevance. So this kind of neo-pragmatist message is, is, is very familiar um, um, in the philosophy of probability, even by people who think of themselves as, uh, um, as it were, not as pragmatists, but as metaphysicians. Um, Mallow and Lewis, uh, uh, I think would be horrified to think of themselves as pragmatists. 
In the case of causation, I think it's hard to find the equivalent point in mainstream metaphysics of causation. Many people think we need objective causal relations to explain rational action, to explain what it is for an action to be rational. But here too, there's a neo-pragmatist tradition, again, dating from Ramsey. And this explains causal concepts in terms of the agent's perspective. As Ramsey puts it in, in uh, the paper I quoted from before, he says, from the situation when we are deliberating seems to me to arise a general difference of cause and effect. And in uh, um, a lot of uh, previous work, I've argued that this approach provides the best explanation of both issues, the connection with action, that's the practical relevance constraint, and the temporal arrow of causation. Fourth step. Dispositions, what are dispositions? Uh, this quote comes from um, the article on dispositions in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, the author, John Mayer, says, dispositions are those properties picked out by predicates like is fragile or is soluble, or alternatively by sentences of the form, X is disposed to break when struck. Dispositions so understood have figured centrally in the metaphysics and philosophy of science of the last century and also in influential accounts of the mind, such as that of Gilbert Ryle. What matters from my point of view is that when we ascribe a dispositional property uh, to the world or to some object in the world, we commit ourselves to an expectation about how the object would behave in certain circumstances. But expectation is a psychological notion um, it's a psychological notion of great practical relevance to us. Clearly, we prepare for the future by forming expectations about what's going to happen next. So where should we look for an account of the psychological relevance of dispositional properties? This is the practical relevance issue again. And again, we can distinguish two approaches. So the metaphysical approach begins with, as it were, the nature of the properties and then has to give an account of their practical relevance. What is it about these properties that makes it the case that when we know about the property, we should form an expectation? The neo-pragmatist approach begins at the other end, saying that we develop these descriptions because what, they're what we need as epistemically limited creatures concerned about our own future welfare. So the expectational character of the manifest image is grounded in our own psychology and temporal character. In other words, for creatures such as us, limited, epistemically limited creature whose welfare depends on the future in the various ways, we develop the practice of, um, as it were, going around the world, putting, putting these labels on things, which are tags to tell us what, what expectations to form um, you know, when we see one of these tags. So this account, of, in this way of putting things, the neo-pragmatist way of putting things, the practical use of this practice of putting labels on things comes first. Uh, and so then there's no explanatory work to be done in explaining why uh, dispositional terms have the practical relevance they do. That's what they're designed to do. That's what a neo-pragmatist says. Uh, I'm just going to give you four landmarks from that history, most of them well known, one of them I, I, I think uh, rather obscure, but I, I, relevant for reasons I'll explain. The first of them, which is um, perhaps the most well known of all, and the one I mentioned right at the beginning, is David Hume's view on cause and necessity, uh, often described as the view that our feeling of necessity when we, when we see a, what we call a cause causing an effect. Our feeling that there's a necessity in the world there is just a projection of the expectations which we, or the, or the habits that we acquire as a result of observed regularities. So that's a familiar view, less familiar view. This is from some uh, lecture notes from Wittgenstein in 1930. 
Um, and this is interesting in, in my narrative, partly because this is a time, um, it's, it's just after Ramsey's death, but it's at a time when Wittgenstein was clearly uh, influenced by Ramsey. Wittgenstein says, when I say there is a chair over there, this sentence refers to a series of expectations. Here's this notion of expectation again. I believe I could go there, perceive the chair and sit on it. I believe it is made of wood and I expect it, and there's expectation again, to have a certain hardness, inflammability, etc. Skipping forward again uh, to Ryle in 1949, um, Ryle's views described by uh, Alexander Bird from a paper from 2012. Bird says the sentence, this lump of sugar would dissolve if placed in water or um, equivalently, this lump of sugar is soluble, does not assert some factual truth such as the attribution of a real property to a thing. Rather, along with law statements, such assertions must be understood as inference tickets. One is entitled to infer from this lump of sugar is in water to this lump of sugar is dissolving. So again, that's a story that we could, uh, again, explain in terms of expectation. There's an interesting backstory that I don't have time to go into here, um, but which is in the written version of the paper. Uh, recent work by, um, by Cheryl Missack um, shows conclusively, I think, that a, quite a large part of this view that, uh, of Ryle in Oxford um, came from uh, Ramsey in Cambridge uh, via the intermediary of a, a, a philosopher whose contribution in this field hasn't been properly recognized. Okay, that was my, that was my third uh, landmark. The fourth one is Ramsey. ...of all empirical concepts whatsoever. It's a picture inspired by Kant, by Sellers, and it replaces the Hume and habitual conception of the psychology involved with a, a normative conception. So in this uh, inferentialist picture, concepts are understood in terms of their role in the dynamic behavior of norm-governed uh, inference engines rather than merely sort of habitual um, inference engines in the Humean sense. Now, that's an important distinction that we don't need to worry about here, worry about it here. Uh, what's important here is what it has in common with, with the three earlier markers is that in all cases, dispositional concepts are being understood in terms of their role in the temporal dynamics of creatures like us, creatures with, with sort of limited uh, epistemic access to the future and to welfare that depends on the future. So the conclusion then is that a major part, at least, of the properties we ascribe to the world reflect the temporal character of human thought, in particular our striving to prepare for an uncertain future. And in this way, our own temporal character is reflected in our image of the world, our image of the world we inhabit both in science and in everyday life. And again, these are pragmatist le lessons. They require that we reflect on our own natures as physical entities of a particular kind. Processes embodied in time in which each stage has an interest in later stages. Okay, so this is a this is powerful ammunition for the pragmatist point of view. And it's very general um, because the, kind, the, the kinds of properties and concepts to which this view is now being uh, applied uh, includes at least most of them. But is it necessarily a global neopragmatism? Couldn't there be an immediate non-dispositional core to our picture of the world, which is untouched by these points? And to, answer, to argue that the answer to that question is no, let's move to the fifth uh, step on our stairway. I quoted Wittgenstein. Uh, Wittgenstein from 1930 saying, every sentence we utter in everyday life appears to have the character of a hypothesis. And Wittgenstein goes on, the representation loses all its value if the hypothetical element is dropped, 
because then the proposition does not point to the future anymore. Now, I think Wittgenstein is thinking here of the way in which our descriptions build in expectations. But time sign, it's a gift to the future in some way, something that we put in place for later use by someone else or by our later selves. And the fact that we can do that depends on the fact that we're all disposed to produce and interpret signs in a pretty regular ways, with not much variation between us or individually over time. And suppose you're, you, you, you need to go to the supermarket to buy some milk. Uh, you're a bit forgetful, so you write, don't forget to buy milk on the palm of your hand. The fact that you can do that and it works when you get to the supermarket depends on the fact that there's something in common between you when you wrote it on your hand and you when you get to the supermarket. What we'd ordinarily say is you're interpreting the, the words you wrote on your palm in the same way at both points. Now, the, the famous rule following considerations um, from Wittgenstein, particularly as interpreted by Kripke, um, turn on the observation that no finite amount of training can guarantee that two speakers won't diverge at some later point. Um, and as I interpret um, um, these points, what they reveal is a sense in which all of language depends on contingent facts about us. Um, and so it provides an argument for global pragmatism. That's a point I made in, in my first book, Facts and the Function of Truth, back in 1988. And similar points were made by um, Philip Pettit a little bit later, and by Crispin Wright in his um, book, Truth and Objectivity from 1992. Wright doesn't conclusively endorse this view, but he does describe very clearly the way in which the rule following considerations have this possible interpretation. Okay, now to the, the last step on our stairway. And it concerns um, a viewpoint in philosophy of mind and neuroscience and psychology, which is called predictive processing. Now here, uh, even more um, than at the earlier steps of the stairway, I'm, I'm relying very much on the work of others. Um, but I think I've chosen my source as well. Um, and uh, I, I think it fits into the, to the general um, trajectory I've been describing uh, towards global pragmatism. So far, what we found is that all, at all three corners of the mind language manifest world triangle in concepts, terms and properties, at all three corners, we found the marks of the kind of temporal creatures we are. And I've argued that these are deeply neo-pragmatist conclusions. even further, um, with further implications for pragmatism. And then as a, um, a little sort of epilogue, I want to show how um, this viewpoint seems to have applications to uh, some of the, uh, to our starting point, that is to the views in particular of Hume. As I said, I'm going to do this mainly by quotes. Uh, this first quote comes from an Australian philosopher called uh, Jakob Hoey, who's one of the leading philosophical writers on what's called the predictive processing framework. Hoey says, a new theory is taking hold in neuroscience. It's a theory that the brain is a sophisticated hypothesis testing mechanism, which is constantly involved in minimizing the error of its predictions of the sensory input it receives from the world. This mechanism is meant to explain perception and action and everything mental in between. It has enormous unifying power, and yet it can explain in detail too. Or from Andy Clark, uh, another of the leading philosophers writing on this, Clark says, creatures de deploying this kind of strategy learn to become knowledgeable consumers of their own sensory stimulations. They come to know about their world, and about the kinds of entity and event the populated creatures deploying this strategy when they see the grass twitch in just that certain way are already expecting to see the tasty prey emerge 
and are already expecting to feel the sensations of their own muscles tensing to pounce. An animal that has that kind of grip on its world is already deep in the business of understanding that world. You see how these notions of expectation are coming in again. Some people have suggested that there's a tension between this predicting, predictive processing viewpoint and pragmatism, but um, um, this quote from uh, a young Cambridge philosopher called Dan Williams um, is arguing against that. Uh, Williams says, the initial appearance of a deep conflict between pragmatism and predictive processing is illusory. Far from an image of mind as passive, of minds as passive spectators on the world, Predictive processing advances a fundamentally pragmatic brain, striving to maintain the viability of the organism under hostile conditions, and in doing so, actively generating an effective niche, an experienced world structured by the idiosyncratic practical interests of the organism. What emerges is something much more, much closer to Price's metaphor of a holographic data projector than a passive reflection of an independently identifiable world. As Clark puts it, it's a vision of experience. So there's confirmation of, uh, uh, from an expert in my sense that um, the predictive processing framework um, is deeply congenial to the kind of global neo-pragmatism um, that I want to maintain. To finish up, I'm going to give you some thoughts from Daniel Dennett. So in recent work, Dennett has proposed that the predictive processing framework helps to explain the core idea in Hume's neopragmatism. Then it says, one of the things in our world is causation, and we think we see causation because the causation in the world directly causes us to see it. The same way tigers in the moonlight cause us to see tigers. When we see the thrown ball causing the window to break, the causation itself is somehow perceptible out there. Not so, says Hume. This is a special case of the mind's great propensity to spread itself on external objects. It's a quote from Hume. In fact, Hume insisted, what we do is to misinterpret an inner feeling and anticipation as an external property. The customary transition in our minds is the source of our sense of causation, a quality of perceptions, not of objects. But we misattribute it to the objects, a sort of benign user illusion, to speak anachronistically. So that's, um, that's Dennett's characterization of the Humean view uh, that I alluded to earlier. Then it says, if we use the shorthand term projection to try to talk metaphorically about the mismatch between the manifest and scientific image here, what's the true long story? What's literally going on in the scientific image? A large part of the answer emerges, I propose, from the predictive coding perspective. Then it gives us an example. He says, think of the cuteness of babies. It's not, of course, an intrinsic property of babies, though it seems to be. What you project out onto the baby is in fact your manifold of felt dispositions to cuddle and protect and nurture and kiss and coo over that little cutie pie. It's not just that when your cuteness detector based on facial proportions, etc., fires, you have urges to nurture and protect. You expect to have those very urges. And that manifold of expectations just is the projection onto the baby of the property of cuteness. When we expect to see a baby in the crib, we also expect to find it cute. That is, we expect to expect to feel the urge to cuddle it and so forth. Then it's a signals. The, sorry, the absence of prediction error signals is interpreted as confirmation that indeed the thing in the world we are interacting with is the properties we expected it to have. Cuteness as a property passes the Bayesian test for being an objective structural part of the world we live in, and that's all that needs to happen. Any further projection process 
would be redundant. And then, and then it concludes what's special about properties like sweetness and cuteness is that their perception depends on uh, particularities of the nervous systems that have evolved to make much of them. The same is also, the same is of course also true of colors. This is what's left of Locke's and Boyle's distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Now, I found all of that uh, very congenial, of course, and, um, and it's very nice for my story, but then it extracts that from the predictive processing framework. But I want to make one note before closing. So Dennett is here taking for granted that this is a local distinction and not all properties are like this. But I've gone further and argued for William James's, James's global conclusion. In my view, the study of the temporal aspects of language and thought confirms James's suspicion that the trail of the human serpent is thus over everything. Thank you very much. That's the end. I'll leave you with William James and again with the six-headed serpent. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, Professor Price uh, be making a very uh, insightful presentation about time and climatism, connecting it uh, with many of the previous uh, great philosophers. We have been talking about him and then talking about many other uh, great people. Now, uh, what I like to is to introduce uh, a commentator uh, for this lecture, uh, Helen Beebe. Uh, professor Beebe is uh, a professor of philosophy of, uh, philosophy of science at University of Leeds. Previously, she has taught in University of Manchester, University of Birmingham, University of Edinburgh, and UCL, and so forth. And Professor Beebe, uh, Richard, Uh, that is really a British tradition, a very important tradition uh, from John Locke to Hume and now uh, uh, up to the Cambridge philosophers to discuss them. Uh, uh, Professor Beebe is also studying David Lewis. Uh, with that, uh, 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 I'd like very much to ask uh, the presence of Professor Beebe now to uh, make a comment on uh, on uh, Professor Price's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Beebe. Thank you very much, Rex. Um, so can you all hear me all right? I got a message saying my internet connection is unstable. Yes. Is it fine? Thank you, Carlo. Right. Um, so um, it's a really great pleasure to respond uh, to Hugh's talk, and I'd very much like to thank the Dewey Center at Fuden for inviting me. Um, I've been an admirer of Hugh's work for a very long time, despite being very firmly rooted in the tradition that he's kind of been valiantly trying to talk us all out of, which is to say metaphysics. Uh, and in this response, I'm not gonna say anything about the finer details of his talk really. Instead, I'm gonna talk in very broad brush terms about what I find deeply appealing in some aspects of the neo-pragmatist position that he has done such an elegant and persuasive job of arguing for, um, and ask a question about whether he thinks it's coherent to take those parts and leave the rest. So this connects directly with what he was saying right at the end about Dennett taking a local rather than a global perspective. So we sometimes tell beginning philosophy students that the basic point of philosophy is to try and figure out the nature of reality and our place in it. To put it very crudely, the pragmatist approach is to start with the latter, our place in reality. So for the pragmatist, our starting point is to ask why creatures like us find it useful to think and talk about the world in the way that we do. The nature of reality kind of in scare quotes, which of course is not to be understood as the remit of metaphysics, flows from the pragmatist story about why it is that creatures like us find it useful to think and talk about the world in those ways. 
Of course, the approach of the metaphysician is to start with the former part of the undergraduate definition of philosophy with the figuring out the nature of reality part. The metaphysician, or at least the standard contemporary analytic metaphysician, uh, metaphysician as I will call them for short from here on in, I think, um, takes as given what Robert Brandom calls the Procrustean semantic paradigm that insists that the only model for understanding meaningfulness is a representational one. To be sure, the metaphysician might permit the odd exception, say in matters of taste, or perhaps if she's really radical in matters of morality, but those are peculiarities. And anyway, once the Procrustean semantic paradigm has been given up in some area, the expressivist treatment, we've left the nature of reality behind at that point. We're just talking in effect about our attitudes. And so when it comes to the nature of reality, there's nothing more to be said. So the metaphysician can kind of pack up and go home at that point. What about that second element of philosophy, our place in the reality in whose nature the metaphysician is interested? Again, I think it's fair to say that increasingly metaphysicians regard this as none of their business. How we engage and interact with reality is a matter broadly for epistemology and the philosophy of mind, for the study of perception and knowledge and such like. And in particular, metaphysics and philosophy of language have pretty much completely parted company aside from uncritical appeals to Kripke when it suits people's metaphysical agenda. For someone like me, who was brought up on a diet of Quine and Putnam, this is deeply puzzling. A surprisingly common refrain in contemporary metaphysics is, uh, I'm interested in the nature of reality and not in what words mean. This is a slogan that I can't make any sense of, assuming as it does that what the words we use in articulating our metaphysical theory actually mean is completely irrelevant to what the theory is saying about the reality it purports to describe. So as I say, contemporary metaphysics in general is really not very interested at all in our place in the world. And in particular, that central question that guides the pragmatist agenda, why do we think and talk about the world in the ways that we do, is one that plays pretty much no role in most contemporary metaphysical thinking. Well, in fact, that's not quite true and in particular, it's not quite true when it comes to what's now the dominant framework for understanding causation, namely the interventionist approach. Causation is the place where I find a pragmatist approach really appealing, and it plays a crucial role in Hume's attempt in his talk to lead us out of the mire of Brandon's Procrustean semantic paradigm of representationalism and kind of into the sunny uplands of global neo-pragmatism. So I want to say something about how the contemporary debate about causation connects with the neo-pragmatist project. That debate, I think, makes for a promising hunting ground for someone looking for potential converts to the neo-pragmatist cause. So the place to start is, of course, with Hume. Uh, and Hugh's talked a bit about Hume, but I'm going to talk a bit more about Hume. Uh, in his talk, Hume notes that Hume can be read as a neo-pragmatist about causation, and I agree with him about that. Hume describes his treatise on human nature as an attempt to do the science of man, and his main concern there is to figure out how, given the assumed raw materials of the flux of sensory experience, the human mind gets to think, both in general and with respect to particular domains, causation, moral and aesthetic value, and so on. Finding nothing in sensory experience that could possibly serve as the content of some of ideas, and in particular, at least according to some people, including me, the world, William James's human serpent, which it is, is to say more or less. But Hume's pragmatist stance when it comes to causation comes not simply from the fact that he takes our causal talk and thought to be a matter of projection. The reason why he can find nothing in our sensory experience that answers to the impression of necessary connection, and hence the source of our idea of necessary connection, is that he takes that idea to be one that serves a particular and extremely important purpose in our cognitive lives, namely inference from the observed to the unobserved. At any rate, one can tell a perfectly good story about what role that impression plays on Hume's view, even if Hume himself doesn't exactly give that story. And here briefly is how I think it might go, or at least the start of it. We are, Hume thinks, creatures that form expectations on the basis of past experience of regularity. This inferential habit 
is essential to our practical concerns. No creature that failed to have it could possibly survive. We wouldn't know to eat bread rather than hemlock or to step away from the precipice or the speeding car. What the idea or the impression of necessary connection adds to that inductive ability, I think, or at least this is part of the story, is a kind of immediacy. For the most part, inductive inference is not conscious. Neither I nor the dog, are co I'm constantly busying my conscious mind with explicit inferences from past experience. That would be exhausting. So the unconscious inference takes place, the expectation arises kind of as if I'm bidden in my mind and I act accordingly. But expectations can arise from all kinds of unconscious processes and it will help us if we can distinguish the good, the inductively based expectations from the bad. Expectations that arise from wishful thinking say, or the indoctrination of a cult leader are not good ones to act on. The impression of necessary connection is a way of sorting the good expectations from the bad. When your expectations are accompanied by the impression of, expect of necessary connection, that's to say you're thinking of the future event you're expecting as an effect of what you've just observed. Well, now you're in effect assured that you're acting on the basis of an established regularity and not just say wishful thinking. That's a very useful feature for human psychology to have. Well, so far so pragmatist. The problem with Hume's account is that while he sees perfectly well that the idea of necessary connection has a temporal arrow to it, he can't see a way of accounting for that fact. And so he simply builds it into his account as a matter of brute fact that causes precede their effects. Not a very pragmatist thing to do. And it's also problematic from the point of view of metaphysics. After all, it really doesn't seem to be a priori that there can be no such thing as backwards causation. Unfortunately for metaphysics, an account of causation as temporal asymmetry turns out to be extremely problematic. But if we're prepared to take the Humean step and think of causation as a matter of projection, help is at hand, courtesy of Frank Ramsey and of course, Hugh himself. That's Hugh and not Hume, Hugh himself. We get the required temporal direction not from mere inductive expectations, which run just as well from future to past as they do from past to future, but from our agency. It's our self-conception as agents that makes us think of the past as fixed and the future as open. And hence what gives causation, which again is no mind independent feature of reality, but a project projection, it's temporal arrow. So how does all of that connect with the contemporary landscape? Well, in the last 20 years or so, the approach to causation that's come to dominate has been the interventionist approach, started by Judea Pearl in his 2000 book, Causality, and pursued since then by, uh, by philosophers such as Chris Hitchcock and Jim Woodward. Uh, Woodward's very long book, Causation with a Human Face, uh, was published about a year ago. Interventionism's guiding thought is that one thing's causing another is a matter of its being true that were you to intervene on the first thing, the second thing wouldn't happen. In a sense, the interventionist approach is not so very different to that of its predecessor as the dominant framework for thinking about causation, which was David Lewis's counterfactual approach. After all, the question, were I to intervene on this, would that happen, uh, is a counterfactual question, right? But there are two features of interventionism, I think, that mark a significant shift away from the Lewisian approach, which is unashamedly metaphysical, and towards a more neo-pragmatist outlook. The first is that interventionism has its origin in questions about how we can draw good causal inferences, rather than in the metaphysical question about the nature of causation. Uh, and that's, of course, very much in the spirit of Hume, as I earlier described him. Hume's primary concern was with our inferences from the observed to the unobserved. This is a much more pragmatist friendly starting point than is Lewis's, which simply takes how we think and talk about causation for granted and attempts to figure out what feature of reality might answer to that way of thinking and talking. One upshot of this, I think, has been an increasing interest in questions about the purpose of our concept causation. This is an approach that runs throughout Woodward's recent book, but that approach is also is also increasingly taken in, for example, disputes about whether our concept of causation is a normatively loaded one. So that to put it very crudely, we take any norm violating events to be causes. That debate is often now conducted in terms that explicitly concern why it might or might not serve our practical concerns to have a normatively loaded concept of causation as opposed to a more egalitarian one.
look is, of course, the role of intervention itself. Interventions do exactly the same job for interventionists as the agent's perspective does for Ramsey and for Price. They sever the probabilistic dependence of causes on their causes, thereby making them the analog of Ramsey's ultimate contingency. The interventionist approach, it seems to me, both in its kind of ideological underpinnings, in its concern with how and why human beings think about the world in causal terms, and in its technical framework, is very well suited to fit the neo-pragmatist agenda. Woodward himself, however, is unwilling to take that extra step. As he puts it in his recent book, on my view, a functional perspective on causation, that's to say a perspective that focuses on the cognitive purposes that the concept of causation serves, need not and should not commit us to projectivism or anti-realism about causation. My alternative picture consists in a kind of minimal realism about causation, he says. The difference between those relations that are merely correlational and those that are causal has its source out there in the world and is not the upshot of our project, project, projecting our inductive commitments onto the world. Causal claims are thus truth apt in the sense that they're straightforwardly true or false, depending on how matters stand in the world. Well, what Woodward signals here, in effect, is an uncritical acceptance of James's of, of sorry Brandon's Procrustean semantic paradigm that insists that the only model for understanding meaningfulness is a representational one. Of course, as Hughes' work so clearly demonstrates, that semantic paradigm is not obligatory, not in general, and not in the context of deploying an interventionist framework for understanding causation. So Woodward clearly doesn't want to get on the neo-pragmatist path at all. Me, by contrast, I'm seriously tempted to get on the path. I think that a projectivist story about causation is plausible and illuminating, and it's a story that enshrines a broadly pragmatist way of thinking about causation. What I personally don't want to do is make the globalization move that Hugh talks about. Of course, as he so clearly shows, once you've made the pragmatist move with respect to causation, it's pretty much impossible to stop there. You're going to have to take in dispositions, laws, and modality more generally while you're at it. What I want to be able to do uh, is to do all of that and still keep hold of a distinctively metaphysical agenda. In my case, that agenda is a broadly Humean agenda in the metaphysical sense. The idea that reality itself is constituted by a Humean mosaic of matters of particular fact, as David Lewis puts it, and everything else, and in particular, everything modal in character, is constructed out of or projected onto that mosaic. So I want to end with a question for Hugh, which in a sense picks up on the very last thing uh, he talked about in his presentation, which is this, does it make sense to go just part of the way down the road to full blown globalized pragmatism, but stop at the point where we've got a projectivist story about causation, dispositions and modality more generally, but sticking with the Humean metaphysics? The nub of the issue, at least as Hugh presented it in his talk, is the fact that language itself is to be explained in terms of our dispositions. And I'm granting here that a neo-pragmatist story about dispositions goes hand in hand with the neo-pragmatist story about causation. But I'm not entirely convinced that we therefore need to reject the Procrustean paradigm of representational language across the board. What I want is to hang on to the idea that we have the capacity, even if it's a very modest and restricted capacity, to talk about the world as it is in itself without the trail of the human serpent. But maybe if I want that, I need to resist the lure of the kind of partial neo-pragmatism that I find so attractive. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I very much hope not. That's it. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, you have uh, discussed a lot about uh, uh, causality, causation problem uh, related to uh, how we see the world, also in gender and other issues. It would be very interesting and uh, we can continue the, the dialogue and discussion. Uh, now I'd like very much to, to uh, in, now I'd like very much to uh, invite the uh, next commentator uh, Professor Carlo uh, Rivoli. Uh, he is a very renowned uh, uh, scholar in uh, physics and, uh, and philosophy. He is the professor in the Department of Physics in Alex uh, Marcel University. 
and also the adjunct professor uh, in Department of Philosophy in University of Western Ontario. Uh, also a distinguished visiting research chair in Parameter Institute. Uh, professor Lovelli is considered a world thinker. In year 2019, he was elected as 100 most influential global thinker by the foreign uh, policy magazine. And year 2021, the world's 50 top thinkers by Prospect magazine. And uh, uh, a lot of ideas that uh, we can share with. Uh, uh, his background is in physics uh, with a PhD in University of uh, uh, Padova in Italy. And then he has some kind of connection with China uh, uh, in his CV. <laughs> Time. So uh, it would be great that uh, Professor Robili would be uh, talking to us instead of hearing his recording. So uh, let's welcome Professor Robili for his uh, comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this uh, um, very kind introduction. Um, I uh, am uh, talking from Canada. It's uh, um, past three o'clock in the night, so I hope uh, I will not fall asleep during while I'm talking. Uh, for the moment, it's okay. I'm uh, um, I'm awake enough. I will not be talking long, um, but I'm very happy of this uh, uh, opportunity. Um, so let me start by saying that I am a physicist. I'm not a philosopher, and uh, uh, I'm interested in listening to philosophy. Uh, but uh, I speak as a physicist. Uh, but uh, I have always been a defender of the uh, usefulness of the dialogue between physics and philosophy. And for me, the case of Hugh Price is uh, exemplar in this uh, 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 relation because uh, um, uh, he is a, a philosopher uh, who... Um, uh, talks in a way and uh, uh, in a form uh, which uh, a physicist can uh, uh, find immense uh, um, uh, utility in, in, in listening. I've been, uh, um, it has been for me since long time a source of insight, uh, ideas and uh, uh, inspiration. There's a contiguity very close uh, between uh, uh, the kind of questions, foundational questions uh, on which I have been uh, uh, in led by by my work mostly on quantum gravity and the kind of things that you has uh, uh, addressed. Um, his book on the arrow of time, for instance, has been a great influence on me. And his recent um, uh, my my recent getting to know his uh, ideas on neopragmatism is again having a, a marked influence on my uh, on my work and way of thinking. So perhaps because of that, <clears throat> uh, this continuous influence. Uh, I find myself in a in a difficult position as a commentator because I tend to agree with most of the things that I hear uh, from uh, from him. So much so, um, Rex, you mentioned my my book, The Order uh, of Time, uh, which of course is is it's, it's close to the topic um, of your presentation, uh, time and pragmatism. Uh, and in my book, the main thesis of, of, of my book, The Order of Time, is that, uh, or one of the main theses, is that uh, if we want to understand temporality, and I'm talking as a physicist, uh, uh, we just don't understand what time uh, uh, temporality if we only uh, look at the world outside ourselves without looking at ourselves. So one of the main theses of the book is that uh, to make sense of what time is, uh, uh, we have to... Um, to a good extent, uh, turn turn the uh, uh, the focus inward and uh, um, ask how we function as uh, situated uh, creatures and as uh, uh, thinking creatures that uh, have a brain and do stuff. And uh, a lot of what we see in 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 temporality can only be understood by looking at our uh, at our brain. So obviously there is a uh, it's a, it's a, with respect to me, uh, Hugh is opening 
um, uh, doors which are uh, already open. I am deeply convinced that there is no fundamental direction of time. Um, and uh, 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 these are uh, common grounds on which we, uh, we start. So what I'm gonna do, it's uh, uh, just to make three observations, um, which I try to uh, compare, where I try to compare his perspective to my perspective about time and try to try to, uh, a little bit like Helen did, uh, try to gauge my, uh, to which extent I'm, 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 uh, I'm close to uh, or, or far or, the, or not to his uh, uh, global uh, uh, neopragmatism and to his, uh, <clears throat> um, to, to, to his idea that the, the trail of the human ser serpent is of uh, uh, everything. Let me, the, the, three, the three comments will be different in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, nature. Um, two of them uh, are somehow discussed in my book, or ideas in my book. Uh, one is more related to uh, some uh, recent uh, works of mine. So let me start from the first. Um, it's, it's a bit perhaps marginal to what, uh, to what uh, you said, but, uh, but uh, it's central, I think, when we talk about time. Um, uh, I think that the no talking about time is a slippery uh, discussion uh, um, for one specific reason, which I want to just put there, which when there are a lot of discussions about the nature of time, uh, and uh, they are often on different topics. And the reason is that uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we talk about time, what we mean depends very much on the context in which we're, uh, we are talking. Um, and careful, here I'm sort of uh, staying close to uh, use, uh, uh, from use, uh, 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 What we what we're talking about when we talk when we're talking about time, um, and my answer as a physicist is that uh, the notion the, need, the, the 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 notion of time is highly uh, complex and rich and uh, stratified, uh, and let me let me say more precisely what I mean. A lot of what um, uh, you have been uh, saying about time regards the direction of time. And there is one, uh, in fact, one thing we could, one idea we can have is that time being different in the past and the future, it's one of its so heavy and main uh, characteristic um, that it's a defining part uh, of it, right? And that's also part in what uh, Craig Callagher says in the book that uh, um, you have cited. But if you take a book of mechanics, physics, a textbook, a good textbook, uh, it starts uh, by saying that time is a fundamental concept there and is not oriented. There is no difference between past and future. So it's still talking about time, but in a different sense, uh, in a somehow wider or in a different sense, more restrict, restricted sense. Um, Next, if you, if, you, if you look at the same book, one of the characterizing features about time is that it's a well-defined quantity, which we share and is unique and is univocal and is measured by all our clocks. So that's what time is. Uh, but then you take a, a book of special relativity, it just denies this fact in the very first pages. And you can go on. If you go to general relativity, you go to uh, quantum gravity, at each step you, um, talk about time in, in ways in which you have dropped the aspect which seem, uh, uh, which seem the characterizing time at a different, in a different context. Uh, so in, in, this, in, in this, given this, uh, asking what is time, uh, uh, it's, uh, um, it's uh, confusing and it's wrong because uh, uh, I think we do understand temporality by uh, breaking this notion apart. And this means in particular also that uh, uh, this uh, characteristic features um, that of temporality uh, on which uh, you make the, uh, the accent of focus uh, and connecting them to, um, 
uh, the, 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 our perspective of creatures uh, are connected to some of these aspects. And the, my question as a physicist is that to which extent uh, the other aspect of temporality. For instance, just you go to classical mechanics, there's no distinct distinction between time and future, between past and future. Uh, the fact that we have a perspective um, as deliberating agents seems to fade in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the backward. Um, what I'm saying is that on the one hand, I learned the lesson. Um, of the importance for understanding some aspect of temporality uh, in terms of uh, 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 of our own uh, perspective of deliberating agents, uh, uh, but this is just one of the many aspects of temporality. That's um, it's uh, it's only a first a first comment. I just wanted to um, emphasize the fact that I view time as a very uh, stratified. Uh, notion in this way. And I think to understand it is not sufficient to understand um, uh, the difference between the past and the future. Let me come to a second remark, which is um, the most hard to uh, uh, communicate for me, probably. Um, I Here it's where I want to measure how much, and I'm not sure, uh, I'm in Full agreement, or I am, uh, uh, I move away from uh, from you. Let me start from the hard, uh, from the hard point. Um, again, from the perspective of a physicist, I, as I said, I fully, uh, not only un understand but agree, and I use a need as uh, to um, digest the main message from you, which is uh, um, in some concepts and even maybe in all concepts. So maybe in the global um, uh, neo-pragmatist perspective that uh, uh, where you is pushing us, uh, um, I do understand that this is uh, needed. I find this convincing, but there is something which puzzled me, which is the following. This perspective is uh, framed, formulated, expressed by talking about uh, us creatures that have certain uh, concern, a way of thinking. And when we do this talking, we use the same notion and concepts that we are warned depend on ourselves. So there is a, a level of circularity here. I'm not, I've, I don't have anything about this, about circularity in itself, uh, I think is unavoidable, and I'm going to come back to that. But I think this should be pointed out. Um, and in the direction of time, this is <clears throat> particularly strong and uh, a little bit disturbing, because if so much of the direction of time depend on our perspective of deliberating agents, which I believe is true, immediately to me as a physicist, uh, uh, the question comes in and say, wait a We're talking in terms of a direction of time. So how can an agent deliberate unless there is a direction of time? What is it that allows us to talk about deliberating agents if there isn't a relation of time or direction of time? So we have not understood uh, the direction of time. We have simply uh, uh, moved it into a specific, uh, um, uh, for me, physical system, which is the the creatures that is deliberating. And uh, uh, we are just opening another question. What is it that allows things to be the deliberating agents? And, uh, and at this point, the the answer, well, is just the fact that they perceive themselves as deliberating agents is, is, is become, become meaningless. So it seems there is a little bit something to add. And uh, this, let me make a little bit step to make it, uh, I find an ambiguity. Um, in 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 his talk and more more, more clearly in the paper, um, uh, you points give two um, accounts of uh, the perspectival aspect of uh, the orientation of time. <clears throat> One he says, well, he, he quotes Boltzmann, and he makes the analogy with the up and down, and he says, well, we happen to be in a uh, context in which there's an entropy gradient 
there is an irrevers irreversible phenomena. We are uh, part of this irreversible phenomena. Uh, and as such, uh, we, we realize that the time is not fundamental because it, entropy can grow uh, here in one direction, in some sense goes, grows in a different direction somewhere else. So in, um, what we call a past and future is just like up and down, which are uh, local aspect, contingent aspect, and uh, uh, not universal features of reality. I'm completely sold to this uh, explanation. The second answer that uh, you give is that uh, uh, we also, ourselves are time-oriented creatures with memories and agency, and because of this, we read the world in a time-oriented manner. Uh, but these are two explanations which are very different. Uh, the second one relies on the uh, specific aspect of the creatures we are in a much he more heavy way than the first one, because the first one only concerns the where the creatures that we are are, are are located. So they're both perspectival, uh, subjective in very vague sense, but to a very different degree. The first to a much lesser degree than the uh, than the second. And this distinction, I think, is crucial. Is otherwise, it's sort of flattening the 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 role of the of the, in this story. Now, which one do I think is the right answer? Uh, well, my idea is that they're both the right answer. They're perfectly correct, both of them. They just refer to different aspects of uh, temporality. The first one is that aspect of temporality, which is the one that characterizes irreversible phenomena, a gas expand, we see a gas expanding in a, in a chamber and not compressing in a corner. Um, the other one is you know, the sense of openness of the future that we have uh, when we say, uh, I can decide freely what happened tomorrow, I cannot decide freely what happened yesterday. So the past is fixed and the future is open. So again, this seems to be different, uh, um, di di uh, di di different, different things. Um, one of the aspects that seems to me uh, definitely the neopragmatism um, uh, perspective clarifies uh, is the relevance of uh, um, uh, certain aspects of the world. And causation here comes, uh, uh, it's a beautiful discussion on causation on which Helen came in, came in uh, uh, again. I, uh, I understand the debate between uh, uh, causation or something we project on the world and causation or something on the world. Um, I, I, I do understand, I listen to the ones and the others. Uh, but it seems to me that both perspectives taken alone are, are incomplete because uh, of course, um, it seems to me uh, there's no causation out there. I am I'm a theoretical physicist. Any theoretical physicist in fundamental physics doesn't believe there's causation out there. Uh, out there, there are just things happening with some regularities. There's nothing like causation out there in the culture of the theoretical physics today. Um, that just, you know, leftovers from a uh, old ways of thinking. Nevertheless, uh, the distinction between uh, uh, correlation and uh, causation um, uh, that the interventionist approach permits is perfectly well defined, and uh, it characterizes patterns of correlations which are out there in the world. It's complicated pattern of of, uh, of, of uh, structures of uh, which which can be defined there in the same sense in which acuteness of a baby can it, it's out there, because we can just characterize the, the we can just put a computer with uh, artificial intelligence and learn what we say what we indicate when we mean cuteness. Um, a computer can recognize cuteness, uh, artificial intelligence thing with, uh, with, uh, with a sufficient number of examples. Um, of course, this is missing what cute cuteness is altogether, because what we mean by cuteness is something else. Um, so I close the second part with one. Uh, um, one observation that brings perhaps a little bit me closer to uh, to you. I think that we biological organisms, what are we? We are not things, right? We are um, phenomena. Our thinking is a phenomenon and we are irreversible phenomena. 
uh, we have phenomena that uh, has biological organism that are rooted in the um, uh, in the thermodynamical uh, uh, gradient. Uh, and in particular, we animals that have a brain and think and do all this peculiar thing that our brain does, that this thinking is itself a thermodynamical uh, uh, phenomenon, right? It's something which only exists because it degradates free energy. You know, when we think our oh, hot head becomes hot, um, it's just moved away by, as a, a phenomenon. So it's, a, it's temporally oriented um, by its very nature. Our thinking is something which is by by what it is temporary. Oriented. That's why it's so hard for us uh, to think non-temporally. And it's hard for me to do quantum gravity, which is a theory where there is no uh, uh, temporary orientation fundamentally at all. Not only there isn't a, a preferred variable, which is time, uh, not, o not only we, we, you better forget temporality whatsoever and just think in terms of relation between um, uh, between quantities. So precisely because uh, we are so immersed in this thermodynamical arrow, uh, we just read everything and we we uh, our very concept of structure is dynamical and I'm very close to what Hugh says here and is designed to think in terms of um, um, of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of sequences. Um, so this puts me very, very close uh, totally to the uh, you know the the the, the, the global uh, the trail of the human serpent is over everything. Um, and yet, and here, even if I am very far from any, very far sort of culturally from contemporary metaphysical turn of philosophy, nevertheless, I'm closer to Helen when she says, yes, but wait, uh, can't we just uh, nevertheless construct a story as much as possible uh, where us as creature are just a part coming in uh, uh, later on within uh, uh, within a story about the world, and I think this just puts us in a in a in a. There, there is a circularity here, and I'm coming now to when I, what I want to say about circularity. But this is a beautiful circularity. There's not there's nothing wrong. We we're not going to the we're not going to come out of it. Is what uh, uh, Abdel Shimoni called the uh, uh, closing the circle. Right, and uh, uh, we we need a picture of the world, uh, which we find convincing, I, I, from my perspective, from a scientific point of view, within which I can uh, uh, understand how it's possible that creatures le like us have certain features, uh, and these feature certain features are such that we think in this way, and we have this concept, uh, which are the one we use to understand the world. Okay, are we? Moving out from that? No, of course. We are moving little steps out here and there sometimes, but not altogether. Now, last observation, third observation, and here I go on a completely different mood. Um, I want to make one, uh, one, uh, oh, I need, sorry. I need to plug the computer because otherwise it's, it's unplugging. It's, uh, it's dying the battery. Okay. It's blind. So third point that will be short, um, and I think it brings again me back to a strong uh, perspectivalism of you, uh, and this is perhaps more a scientific point, but I think it's a, it's important. Um, I'll be short, but this is this is a bit technical. So um, what the reason we. Uh, the reason there is a, a time orientation outside us is the entropy gradient in which we're immersed, which I agree with you is not uh, a fundamental, um, but it's a feature of the world around us. However, uh, an entropy gradient is something that relates to entropy and entropy um, it's a quantity which has no meaning microscopically as only meaning macroscopically. In a, in a purely microscopical account, dynamical account of what happens, there's no sense of entropy. So entropy comes in when uh, there is something that determines some macroscopic variables and is a property of those macroscopic variables, just the number of microstates uh, that correspond to a certain value, set of value of the microscopic variable. 
Now, the choice of the macroscopic variables is not out of the blue coming from, from outside nature, is determined by the actual um, set of variables uh, um, a system is interacting with. So if a system S interacting with, uh, with another system S prime, there's an interaction between the two. Uh, generically, a, a system S prime interacts only with a small number of variables of S. Um, and these are the microscopic variables. When we uh, when I interact with a gas or with a world, I only interact with a small number out of the enormous number of variables in. To the way two systems interact physically in the coupling between the two systems. But this means that when we say that there is an entropy gradient, so the entropy was lower, low in the past. Um, the entropy we're talking about is the entropy of something with respect to something else. So this open a question. Um, is the fact that entropy is low or was low in the past a feature of the system uh, of to which we attribute entropy or rather to the system which is uh, uh, with respect to which the microscopic uh, co-screening is defined? Especially because low entropy means special in some sense. So um, every baby is very special for its mother, but this doesn't imply that uh, a single baby by itself is special with respect to the other babies, right? So it's the same thing. Is the universe special by itself because it had low entropy in the past or usually around us, or is special with respect to, um, to a certain cost graining that depend on how the subsystem to which we creatures, biological creatures, belong, set of variables that is, de define us as microscopic object belongs, uh, the way this interact with the rest of the universe. Now, the possibility that we could understand uh, low past entropy and therefore the gradient of entropy um, as the, 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 the observing system is being, being special, it's not the universe as a whole being system, is an idea that I've uh, suggested in the paper of a few years ago, um, perspectival uh, entropy. And uh, it is an idea that um, I, I find very compelling. I see reasons to doubt about it. I see reason to take it seriously. I'm not going to delve into, into that, but I wanted to mention this in this context because ultimately um, this gradient of entropy, which I have been sort of saying, uh, look, you, I mean, this is, hard to say that has anything to do with us. It's out there, like the up and down. It's fully perspectival, whatever. But, you know, it's not that uh, um, we thought term the, 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 um, the, 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 the structure of the world being up and down uh, because we have the, the head up and the feet down. It's because we live on a planet and this is, this is an objective fact of, uh, of the environment we, we are, that there is an up and down in the sense of a, of, of a gradient of gravity in the next planet. In the same sense, uh, I was saying, look, the gradient of entropy is out there, but maybe this very gradient entropy itself is profoundly perspectival uh, in, 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 in the sense that uh, um, uh, that it has to only to be understood in relation with something else. So the world could be uh, far more, per in, in my understanding of physicists, uh, far, far more perspectival. And we, 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 even the, the full cosmic uh, uh, evolution in time of the universe, which of course is driven by the, uh, by the, the, the growth of entropy, that's what is, uh, um, is going on, could be a fully perspectival um, uh, aspect. Um, uh, and in this sense, you know, the, the trail of us, a uh, human being with our specific features of all kind that go from our brain to our biological being, um, uh, necessarily irreversible phenom uh, phenomena to the way um, ourselves, the physical system coupling, coupling with the other de de determine this um, uh, cause graining. Um, uh, could be it would be necessary to think in these relational terms. It's uh, this idea is a it's it's a bold idea, but I think I want to close by remembering that the uh, the most majestic uh, spectacle we see on Earth, which is the rotation of the sky around us, um, 
it's completely perspectival because of course uh, we are moving, right? We are rotating, but it has taken humankind millennia of civilization um, to figure this out. So there's much more pe perhaps that we haven't figured out how much perspectival it is. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Carlos, uh, uh, from the uh, scientific point of view, uh, seeing how the uh, problem of time and uh, how we human species been uh, seeing through it. I must say that all of us are very humble. We all see that uh, the human, human species are very limited uh, in our perspective, uh, being locked in time <laughs> and have that perspective uh, that we have to continue. And it is not really possible that we can get out of it. Whatever the case, uh, I think it's about time to pass the time to Hugh to give a response to the two commentators. Hugh, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rex. Um, and thank you, Helen and Carlo, for those fascinating comments. Um, it's, a, it's a real challenge to um, try to do at least some small amount of justice to all of them. But what I'm going to try to do is follow a trajectory. Think of it like a, another serpent, which sort of winds its way among various aspects of those comments. Um, and Helen, I'll start with your, um, your, your inclination to and its concern with the nature of reality. And, and you're worried that the, the neo-pragmatism, uh, global neo-pragmatism leaves no space for that. To that, I want to say, first of all, that um, I think we have to be careful with the notion of reality and other kinds of notions that go along with it, like existence and fact and, and things of that kind. And truth, too, but, but belongs in the same um, package. Uh, and there's an approach which, uh, as uh, you know, of course, uh, many of us who are attracted even to the local forms of, of pragmatism are inclined to take about those notions. Uh, I think, for example, of a, a, a contemporary um, pragmatist such as Simon Blackburn, someone we both know very well, um, who will say, uh, um, with respect to his pragmatism or expressive him, expressivism, say about um, morality or, or about causation, but of course he's not denying that there are facts about those matters. Um, of course, there are, there are facts about what's right and wrong, and there are facts about I don't know what causes what. Um, but those, 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 that's a sort of simple down-to-earth notion of factuality, the, the, the kind of way it's used by ordinary people. What he denies is that there's some deep metaphysical notion of factuality or reality that could be contrasted with that. Uh, and so, uh, my response to to Jim Woodward, I haven't had the time, I haven't had a chance yet to look at his new book, but I suspect, based on past interactions, that my reaction is going to be, look, Jim, I'm, I'm completely on board with you in saying that there there are, there are causal facts out there. The important thing is is that, as it were, how we think of those facts, and the, in the, I, I want to think of them as being kind of downstream in an explanatory sense, downstream of our linguistic and psychological. Uh, practices downstream of the Humean and Ramsian story of how creatures like us come to talk in that way. And once we come to talk in that way, it's part of that talking that we, uh, for, for example, and this is something that Ramsey talks about quite a bit, even in that very short paper uh, from 1929, how it makes sense from that sort of starting point for, for there to be right and wrong about cause of claims, for example. Um, so there's a story to be told there, but once you've told it, then you're entitled to say, I think, with Jim, that yes, yes, in, in, a, in a rather deflated, meaningless sense, your you know, pragmatist is entitled to say, we can be realists about causation too. What, what we reject is a kind of more robust kind of, um, kind of realism, where among other things, it's supposed to be the, um, the, the, the fact in the world causality which explain the way we we talk 
So you could think of that as a view in which the causal facts are kind of upstream of our way of talking. So um, that's, that's part of my response um, to say we have to be careful about the notion of reality and that once, once we deflate it in that sense, there's a perfectly good sense in which we can talk about reality in all of these areas that I want to be neo-pragmatist about. But in a sense, I think that's not uh, the, the more, most interesting part of the response. The most interesting part of the response, I think, focuses on what the role of science is in a story of, of this kind. Um, and there, it, I mean, it's helpful that you, that you mentioned about Hume, that he was interested in, in effect, in, in, in turning the scientific spotlight, the kind of spotlight that, that, that his great predecessors uh, in the 17th century had, had lit up in turning, turning that spotlight on, on we humans ourselves. He was interested in the scientific story of, of human thought. Um, now, that's these days we, we'd say that that's a, a thoroughly naturalistic um, approach to philosophy, and that it's it's putting uh, sort of natural science uh, at, at the centre of things. But I think it's important to distinguish that kind of naturalism from another kind of naturalism, which is what many contemporary metaphysicians mean when they talk about being naturalists. So, no, they. Um, pe pe people like you know, wonderful people like David Lewis and uh, to some extent um, David Armstrong, one of my former colleagues uh, in Sydney. But they'll say that they're, they're naturalist in the sense that they regard the project of, of, of metaphysics as being continuous with science. So like science, it's interested in finding out what's out there in reality. And their naturalism consists in uh, the belief that there's no other reality other than the sort of world in space and time. And there are various ways in which it sort of characterize quite what the naturalism amounts to. But I call that, uh, I call that object naturalism, sort of naturalism about the objects of study in philosophy or metaphysics. And I distinguish that from, from subject naturalism, which is naturalism in the sense of human, naturalism about human thought. And I think it's important to keep those two things apart, um, because um, a, a subject naturalist needn't be an object naturalist. And, and, and again, Ramsey or, or Hume uh, give us examples of how those kinds of things come, come apart. So Ramsey's view about causation, like Hume's view, is that what we need is a subject naturalist standpoint, the, the, the one that thinks about um, and the role of causal thinking in the lives of natural creatures like us, not the object naturally. Natural world. But then, um, so against that background, I can come to your question about whether there's a space for uh, a, a local version of neo-pragmatism. And I want to answer that by, by uh, saying a bit more about what the role of science comes to in the kind of picture I'm, I'm suggesting. Um, and I think it's important to, to note that um, for a subject naturalist, that, um, someone who thinks of then neo-pragmatism as a, you know, a subject naturalist endeavor in the sense of you, there's an important sense in which science is privileged in that viewpoint, because the whole, the, the whole enterprise is really a scientific, intended to be a sort of scientific study in the sense of Hume. It's a scientific study of, of us and our ways of thinking and, and the aspects of the world on which all of those things depend. So in, in the, the, the written version of the paper, I call that a home turf sense of priority for science. So the whole, the whole activity, the whole neo-pragmatist project is conducted on, on the home turf of science. Um, and, and not just a one part of science, because it involves, I mean, typically, uh, as Carlo has explained uh, so nicely, it involves focusing on two things. One is on us and, and sort of the scientific study of us, what's character, characteristic of us as natural creatures. And on the other hand, on, on as it were, the, the physical environment in which we uh, evolved and exist. So it involves both physics and you know, human biology and all the things that go with that. Um, but that sense of privilege 
uh, which I can recognize and um, I think provides some, um, I'm not sure if consolation is, is the right word, but it, it provides some, some comfort anyway to, to the idea that there's something left of the idea that we're interested in investigating in reality. Sure, we, 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 you know, it's, I, 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 we, as in the sense that scientists do that, that's still a, a perfectly um, legitimate project. And not only that, but it's also the project within which uh, um, neo-pragmatism finds its own. Um, <clears throat> but um, I want to distinguish that sense of that sense in which science is privileged within the neo-pragmatist endeavor from another sense in which you might think that it's privileged, but I think it doesn't. So you might think that I, I call this ring fence um, privilege. So it, it would be the idea that there was a sort of fence around the activity of science. So that as neo-pragmatists, we weren't allowed to step up the fence and apply the neo-pragmatist techniques to the uh, to the language and thought within science itself. And of course, I don't believe uh, in, in ring fence privilege. Um, and uh, uh, actually to get this sort of, I can make a little detour here and it connects very nicely with, with Carlo's third point. Uh, I mean, Carlo's third point is a beautiful illustration of why it would be a bad idea to try and insist on ring fence privilege because um, now, here, here's an interesting idea that, that notions in thermodynamic are deeply perspectival, which we wouldn't be able even to entertain if, if we had this idea of a ring fence. So that, you know, the scientific talk within the ring fence couldn't be, um, it, it sort of couldn't be challenged in this perspectival way. Um, okay, so I, 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 I hope that that combination offers some comfort to the intuition that there still is a project of uh, investigating reality. And in a sense, it's the same project that the, the great naturalist metaphysicians of recent decades, such as Lewis and Armstrong, thought they were engaged in. It just turns out to be that they got some things in, 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 in the wrong place. Um, but for, for, as we agree in the case of causation, um, we, we, they were sort of asking the wrong questions. But that doesn't mean that the, the, the basic project of investigating the natural world in the, the way that science does, that project, of course, survives. Okay, um, let me see. Um, oh, and um, now just a couple of comments about um, Carlo's other two points. Uh, uh, the, the second point, the point about circularity, comes in extremely naturally at this point, because um, once you've rejected the idea that science is protected by a ring, ring fence, which prevents us from asking these kind of pragmatist questions about its own concepts, then of course, as Carlo said, immediately we're um, confronted with a kind of circularity. Um, we, are, um, we are using the same concepts we're trying to explain. Uh, I mean, in a sense, I, th I think uh, it's possible to see that about the um, um, the, the, the neo-pragmatist project in a more direct way, because in a sense, what we're what we're asking for for many, at least many of these interesting kinds of concepts, including concepts like causation, we're asking what role those concepts play in our lives. And one way of phrasing that sort of question is that. But that's very close to a question which involves the very notions that we're, we're trying to understand. And there's no getting away from that. But uh, I don't, uh, as I think Carlos said, I don't think it's a vicious kind of circularity. Um, so I think one reason for thinking that there can't be a ring fence is that, that um, science is always going to involve modal and counterfactual and causal notions. Uh, and and they are certainly the kind of notions from which we need the pragmatic standpoint. Now, um, I do think that there's a, a very interesting question, which I think I want to say can always be asked within this kind of viewpoint, which is the question, which is, as it were, 
has, has been so, so important at so many stages in uh, scientific progress, notably within the Copernican revolution. And effectively, it's the question, what kind of world looks like this from our perspective? Um, now, I mean, this is a point on which um, I think my own intuitions get a little bit um, slippery or, or confused. Because on the one hand, I want to say that we can keep on asking that question. I don't, I don't want to admit that we ever get to a point where that question can no longer be asked. We can no longer seek for new kinds of illumination um, by asking the question, what kind of world um, would naturally be described like this from the point of view of creatures like us. And yet, on the other hand, I, I'm committed to saying that the, if we come up with an answer to that question, it can't be a non-perspectival answer because uh, you know, such an answer would be impossible for creatures like us for the kind of reasons that I've talked about. Um, to tie that point back to, um, to some of, um, to Carlo's first point, I, I do think that it's very interesting, and I'm glad you brought this up, Carlo, that some of the kinds of answers that we come up with when we ask that sort of questions are, quest are, are answers in, in, in which the, the notion of time doesn't seem to figure at all. Um, and um, I, I, I've always found that um, an, an attractive possibility and one that I, I wanted to regard as continuous with the discovery that are other aspects of our intuitive concept of time sort of had a human origin. Um, so I, I think I've always felt that I was sort of open to the possibility that, that physics would tell us that time wasn't fundamental. Um, perhaps it's something macroscopic in the way that you describe entropy as being. Um, um, and certainly I, I, I don't want anything I've said to suggest that I was committed to an alternative view, to the idea that there is a single and um, core scientific notion of time about which um, we can, in some sense, be realists the way we're not about the direction of time or um, the difference between past and future or things of that kind. Okay, that was a little bit of a mess, uh, but I, I, I think I've touched on uh, all of the, the, the main points in your uh, fascinating and kind comments. Uh, and I see that uh, we're, we're now um, two minutes past the hour, so it's certainly time to turn over the discussion to the audience. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it is really a good uh, uh, opportunity for uh, science to meet uh, philosophy. Uh, I'm, uh, it is really uh, good that uh, we are able to bring discussion on philosophy and science with uh, Hugh, Helen, and Carlos uh, uh, discussing about uh, time and how we as human species been working through, uh, muttering through and slowly learning more and more and so forth. Now,